Okay, well, now we've gone over <coughs> uh, pretty much all the basic skills that you need to apply Huckel's rule and decide whether a molecule is aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. And what I'd like to do now is just do a bunch of examples to illustrate the skills we've already gone through. So, let's start looking at some examples. What category does this molecule fall in? Aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. So at this point in the videos, we're going to be going through a bunch of examples and deciding what category they fall into. And I hope that after I put each example on the board, you will please pause the video and try the problem on your own. And then when you think you have an answer, start the video up again and you can see whether you got it right. So please go ahead and pause the video so you can decide what category this molecule falls into. What category does this molecule fall into? Is it flat? Well, remember that we said earlier that in many cases you can't really tell whether a molecule is flat just by looking at the picture of it. You'd have to build a model. So on most OCHEM exams, you're generally supposed to assume that the molecule is flat unless there's a good reason not to. So for most of the examples here, we won't really talk about whether the molecule is flat. We'll just assume that. So assuming this is flat, obviously the molecule is cyclic. Is it completely conjugated? Well, remember, that would require us to have a p orbital at every atom in the ring. Well, that really means that we should be making sure that all the atoms are sp2 hybridized. Uh, because an sp2 hybridized atom has a uh, p orbital on it. If any of the atoms in the ring are sp3 hybridized, then we know that the molecule cannot be completely conjugated. Because an sp3 hybridized atom doesn't have any p orbitals. Well, all of these atoms are sp2 hybridized. So they all have p orbitals, and this molecule is completely conjugated. For the rest of the examples that we go through, I'm not going to be specifically talking about whether it's completely conjugated or not, just to save time, uh, unless it's not conjugated. But you should keep checking each molecule to make sure it's conjugated. Now let's count how many pi electrons there are. Well, there's a pi bond over here, so that has two pi electrons. And let's think about this carbon over here. I'm going to go ahead and draw in the hidden hydrogen. So here's the hidden hydrogen here. Now we know that this carbon is sp2 hybridized, so it has a p orbital. And the question is, what's in its p orbital? And the answer is, nothing is in the p orbital for this carbon, because it's a carbocation. So there are no extra electrons to go in that p orbital. There's just an empty p orbital with nothing in it. Um, and uh, we can ask, what uh, is the uh, what type of orbital? What type of orbital is this carbon using for its sigma bonds? Well, remember that since it's sp2 hybridized, it has three sp2 orbitals. It's using one sp2 orbital to bond to the hydrogen, one sp2 orbital to bond to this carbon, and one sp2 orbital to bond to this carbon. So. Again, this carbon is using an sp2 orbital for this sigma bond, an sp2 orbital for this sigma bond, and an sp2 orbital for this sigma bond. That leaves an extra p orbital, but there's nothing to put in it because this is a carbocation. So there's no pi electrons on this carbon. So how many pi electrons are there total? Only two. And that puts us in the category of aromatic. This molecule is aromatic. Uh, by the way, a lot of people uh, forget when they're using Huckel's rule that this series starts with the number 2. So you don't want to forget that. Remember that the way that Huckel's rule is usually presented is that the number of pi electrons in an aromatic compound is supposed to be 4n plus 2. Well, a lot of people think then that the first number in the series should be 6, because when n is 1, this formula would give us 4 plus 2, which is 6. Uh, but you've got to keep in mind that n could also be 0. Well, when n is 0, we get 0 plus 2, which is 2. So a compound with 2 pi electrons is also aromatic. What category does this molecule fall into? Pause the video and figure it out.
There's two pi electrons in this pi bond. Now here we have a carb anion. And you're expected to know that a uh, carb anion with a negative formal charge must have a lone pair. Even though I didn't draw the lone pair in, you're still expected to know that it's there. So whether or not the problem draws the lone pair in, if you see a carb anion, you know that it must have that lone pair in order to have the negative formal charge. This is an sp2 hybridized atom uh, using the exception to the rule for hybridization that we learned about earlier. It has a lone pair and it's bonded to an sp2 hybridized atom over here, so this carbon is also sp2. So it has one p orbital, and what's it doing with its p orbital? Well, it can put the lone pair in its p orbital. So I'll label the lone pair with a p to show that that's in that p orbital. So overall, um, and therefore, these also count as pi electrons. Remember that the pi electrons are the electrons in the side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals. So now we have a total of four pi electrons. One, two, three, four. That puts us in this list, so this compound is anti-aromatic. What category does this molecule fall into? Well, I hope that you're always starting by making sure the molecule is completely conjugated. What's the hybridization of the carbon at the top? It's sp3. Using our basic rule for hybridization, this is going to be an sp3 hybridized carbon. The exception does not apply here because this carbon has no lone pairs. So this is a normal sp3 hybridized atom. That means it doesn't have any p orbitals. That means that this molecule is not completely conjugated. Since this molecule is not completely conjugated, it falls into this category of non-aromatic. So remember, even though I might not be mentioning it on every problem, you still have to check each molecule to make sure that it's completely conjugated before you start counting the pi electrons. And let me remind you of something I mentioned earlier. Once you see that the molecule is not completely conjugated, you don't need to count how many pi electrons there are. It doesn't matter how many pi electrons there are in this category. Any molecule that's not completely conjugated is automatically non-aromatic. Only if you first see that the molecule is completely conjugated, only then does it matter which of these two numbers, which of these two lists we fall into for the number of pi electrons. What category does this molecule fall into? There's two electrons in this pi bond, two electrons in this pi bond. That gives us four pi electrons. That puts us in the anti-aromatic category. Try this example. None of these nitrogens have formal charges, so we know they all must have one lone pair each. All of the atoms are sp2 hybridized. We know that this nitrogen is sp2 hybridized because it has a lone pair and it's connected to an atom that's sp2 hybridized. So that each of the atoms has one p orbital. Each pi bond has, four, uh, has two pi electrons. So there's two pi electrons here and two pi electrons here. This nitrogen has one p orbital. What's it going to do with its p orbital? Well, it can put its lone pair. So these will count as pi electrons. This nitrogen has one p orbital. What's it doing with its p orbital? Well, it's already used its p orbital for the pi bond. So it cannot put the lone pair in the p orbital. So this lone pair will be in an sp2 orbital. So this lone pair does not count as pi electrons. I'd help us remember that maybe we can cross that out to remember that that lone pair does not count as pi electrons. 
This nitrogen is also already using a p orbital for its pi bond. So again, this nitrogen does not have a p orbital to put the lone pair in, so this lone pair also does not count as pi electrons. So how many pi electrons do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six pi electrons. So the molecule is aromatic.